Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Tiny Epic Vikings. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules of the game as it's being played, and I will be showing one out of the game's three rounds today. Now, before I go into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel, you can gain access to a variety of exclusive perks, like watching my opinions episodes where I talk about all the games that I'm playing recently, as well as being able to watch some videos early and advertisement free. You can learn about how you can support the channel by going to patreon.com slash John Gets Games, and I'd really appreciate it. The final thing I'd like to ask is if while you're watching this, you see some part of the game that really jumps out to you, or maybe you see a turn where we should have done something differently, then please comment about that down below because I love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles because I might make mistakes as I'm showing the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. The other thing I do want to mention is the fact that I'm filming with a prototype version of the game today. That means the art and components and potentially some of the rules might change by the time the final version comes out, and I want you to keep that in mind while you're watching. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. In it, each player is in control of a Viking clan, and we are going to go through three generations of trying to control these runic isles. We are going to do that by sailing our ships around. We can also construct new ships as well as temples onto these islands. In addition to that, we can send settlers over to these islands, and the person with the most influence on those islands will gain access to these rune tokens, which can then be used not only to get points at the end of the game, but also to unlock and power up various actions that players will take in the game. Speaking of actions, the game revolves around this deck of cards. In each of the game's three rounds, we are going to deal cards out to all players. Then we are going to draft these, choosing one and passing the rest to the left or the right. And once we've done that for all of the cards in our hand, each of us will then, in order, play one card to a row and then perform various actions on those cards. Those can do all the things that I've talked about already, in addition to starting battles, which allow players the ability to fight over these rune cards and the player who gains access to it will immediately get the benefits at the bottom, and they'll score the runes at the top once the game is over. Now, speaking of these card and island runes, those are associated with gods. As we play through the game, the fury of these gods will increase through a variety of things, including when various Vikings fall in battle and go to Valhalla. Once the game is over, the god who is most furious will give the most points for these island runes and these card runes, and then the less angry gods will follow, giving less points for those runes. Now that was a very high level overview of the game, and I will describe how all of this works in detail while we're playing, and on that note, I think let's now start the game. For today's tutorial, we are going to play as the yellow player right over here, and we can now begin the first out of the game's three overall eras. Now, each era of the game is split into three phases. The first is a card drafting phase, the second is a performing actions phase, and the third is a cleanup phase. This means we can now perform the drafting phase for the first era of the game. In order to do that, let's focus over here on the raven board. As you can see, there is a one raven, a two, and a three, and these show the three different eras that we go through the game, and we start at one. Now, right over here, it shows a four, and it also shows a clockwise circle, and this means that during the card drafting phase of the first era, every player will draw four random cards from the top of the deck, and then we are going to draft those cards in the clockwise direction. The deck of cards is right over here, so let's deal four out to each player. And now all of us will simultaneously take a look at the cards that were just dealt to them. The next thing that we all do simultaneously is select one of these four cards that we have in our hand, and we are going to put that face down in front of us. Then we are going to pass the remaining three cards in the direction that is shown on the raven board, and again, that shows clockwise for the first era. This means after we select one of these cards, we will pass the other three down to the green player, and the red player will be passing us three cards. As you can see, each one of these cards has a variety of icons and effects, and it's important to keep all of these in mind when selecting a card to choose from. The reason for that is because the card that we pick is going to be one that we have in our hand when we're performing actions. I think this is going to be a good card for us, so that means these three will go over to the green player. The green player decided to keep this card here, so they'll pass these three over to red. And then red is going to keep this card and then pass these three over to us. Now, each one of us can once again simultaneously look at the three cards that we have in our hand. And again, we are going to pass them. And it's important to note that the card that we selected already cannot be brought back into our hand to be decided upon. This is definitely a card that we will have in our hand. And we are just going to add to this pile. And that pile will turn into the hand of cards that we are going to play for actions later on during this era. 
Now, once again, there's a bunch of useful information on these cards, and up to this point, I haven't taught what any of this stuff does, and with that in mind, I'm just going to go ahead and finish the card draft, figuring out what cards we'll keep, and then we'll pick things back up again once this phase is over. All right, at the end of this phase, everyone is just going to pass a single card to the person in the indicated direction. So this is the last card being passed to us by the red player, and this is going to be our hand of action cards. Of course, both of our opponents also have four cards in their hand. This means the card drafting phase of the first era is over, but before we move on, I want to briefly show you that when we are in the second era, we are going to deal out five cards and then pass them in the counterclockwise direction, so that means we will all end with five cards in our hand after the draft, and in the third era, we will pass out six cards, and then once again pass those cards in a clockwise direction. So as we go farther into the game, we will have more card options to choose from and to play during the action phase. Speaking of actions, we can now start the playing actions phase of the era. The way this works is the player with the horn is going to be the starting player, and they are going to select one card from their hand to play face up or face down next to their player mat in order to potentially play actions with that card. Out of all of these cards, I think we want to begin by selecting Randy. Now, as I said, the card that we play is going to go either face up or face down, and if we play it face down, that means we are going to be initiating a battle, but I don't think we want to do that just yet, so I'll explain how that works soon. Instead, let's play Randy face up. Next up, let's focus in on this card. As you can see, there are four important pieces of information on it. The top is a specific type of rune that we now have access to for the rest of the era. But once the era is over, all of our played cards will be discarded, and I'll explain how we discard these later on in the tutorial. The next piece of information is this, and that is the battle value for this card. Now that only matters if we put the card face down to initiate a battle, and again, I'll explain how that works later on, so we can effectively ignore that for now. After that, we can see these two things down here, and this is the leader action for the card, and that is the rune action for the card. Now, as you can see, there is an arrow between these two, because we perform the leader action before we potentially perform the rune action. And it is important to know that it's mandatory to play a card either face up or face down on each one of your turns, but all of the effects of that card are purely optional, so technically we could place this down and then just be done with our turn, but I think in this case we certainly want to do some more things. Once again, we decided to play this card face up, and when you do that, you gain access to the leader and rune action options. If we were to go for a battle with this card and use this part, then we would not have access to either of these. I decided these look pretty good to me, so now let's perform the leader action for Randy, and that is a ship sailing action with a value of 3. With that in mind, let's now focus over here on the board. As you can see, at the start of the game, each player has one ship, and we place them down into fjords that are adjacent to the edge as part of setup. Each one of these sections between the islands and bordered by these ferry routes are called fjords, and whenever we do a ship sailing action, we select exactly one of our ships, and we move it up to the value of that action. If you remember, this has a value of 3, and we can use that to move this ship because it's currently our only ship. Players can build more ships throughout the game, and I'll explain how that works later on. So we can now sail with this ship, and the number of movements we can do with this is up to the value of the action, which once again is 3. Now for each one of these moves, we can either move our ship into an adjacent fjord, crossing over a single ferry line, so that would be one move. Another thing that we can do with our ship is dock it at an island, and the other thing you can spend movement on is leaving a dock to go to one of the adjacent fjords. Now in this case, I think I do want to start sailing north, so we'll spend one movement point to go here, and then with our second movement point, let's dock onto this spot. Now the reason we're going up here instead of there is because there is a village token here that was put at the start of the game. Now every time we dock a ship at a village, we have the option of raiding that village by spending an amount of iron equal to the amount listed next to the current era on the raven board. As you can see, the raiding village icon is here, and in the first era, it just costs one iron. And again, this is something that players can do when they dock their ship into a port with one of these village tokens. So, it'll cost one iron to raid this village, and I think I want to do that. And with that in mind, let's focus over here and talk about the resources that we have tracked on our player boards. As you can see, there's a track down here that goes from 0 to 7, and at the start of the game, we have these three tokens on the 2 spot. The black token shows us how much iron we have, 
The brown token shows us how much wood we have, and the white token shows us how much food we have. So we have two of each of those at this point in the game, and again, it only costs one iron to raid that village, and we have two, so I think let's go for it. We can spend the iron by moving it over here, and it's worth noting that the tokens can never go below the zero mark, and obviously you can't spend resources that you don't have, and if your token is all the way up at the seven, and you were to gain more, all excess is simply lost. So you certainly want to spend those resources if it starts getting up near the maximum. So we successfully raided that village, and what that means is we remove the token from the board, and we can put it over here next to our board, and we can use a free action to dedicate this village later on, and I'll explain how that works when we get there. It's worth noting that at the start of the game, we put a village down on each one of these icons on the board, and there is a one to three player version of the board, which we see here, and on the back side, there is a four player version, which has even more of these villages. Now, speaking of that, new villages do not come onto the board as we're playing the game, so that means that this is the total number of villages possible, and as we continue to play the game, it's likely that most of these will be raided. Well, let's focus back over here, and before we move on with our turn, I'd like to discuss one other aspect of movement, and that involves actually going to docks where other players' ships are. If, for example, the green player's ship was already docked there and our ship was here, then for a single movement, we could dock our ship, but this will kick the green player's ship out. In that case, the green player will have to decide which one of the adjacent fjords they want to send their ship to. So, as you can see, each one of the docks can have at most one ship in it, but it's worth noting that multiple ships can hang out in a fjord, and they never interact with each other. Obviously, the green ship is down here at this moment, and we are over there, and up to this point, we've spent two of our overall three movement, which means we could go there for our third movement if we wanted to, or back over there, but I think I actually like the idea of staying docked, so we are going to not use that third movement, and now we can move on with our turn. Now, every time you do a ship sailing action and you end in a port... You then have the option to deploy settlers onto the island that that ship is currently docked at. The number of settlers we can deploy is up to the value of this ship sailing movement, so that means we could actually deploy up to three settlers onto this island right now. So let's focus back on our player area, and as you can see on our player mat, there are three different types of tokens. These are ships that we can build, and these are temples that we can build, and again, I'll explain how we build these later on. Now up here, we have six settlers, and all of these are ready to be deployed to an island. Every time you deploy a settler, you have to spend exactly one food, and at the start of the game, we have two food. This means even though we could potentially deploy up to three settlers, we only have enough food to deploy two of them, and I think that's what we're going to do. So let's spend both of our food, and then we can take two settlers from our board, and then place them on the island where we just docked with our ship. Now, once again, each player has at most six of these settlers, and if you ever have no settlers on your board, because all of them are out here on islands, then as a free action, you can simply pull any of these back to your board to then be able to spend food to immediately redeploy them to the island where the ship you just moved docked. Next up, I'd like to once again focus in on our player aid, in particular over here. Now, as you can see, every time you add settlers to an island, if after adding them, you have more of your settlers on the island than an opponent, then the opponent that has less settlers must remove one of those settlers from the island. So, for example, if the green and red players had happened to have a single settler on this island, and then we brought in two settlers, we now have more than the red player, so red has to remove one, and we now have more than the green player, so green would have to remove one. If in a slightly different example, the green player had two, and the red player had one, and we added both of these, then in that case, only the red player would remove one, because we would not have more than the green player. Obviously, none of that was the case because we are currently taking the first turn of the game, and now that we have finished adding settlers to the island, we can check to see if we control it. Now, the way we control an island is we have to have boots on the ground, and we have to have the most influence compared to other players who have boots on the ground on that island. By boots on the ground, I mean figures on the island itself, and ships that are docked do not count. That means we have both of these, and those are boots on the island, and if we had constructed a temple on that island, this would also count as boots on the island. But again, we haven't done that just yet. Because we have at least one figure on the island, again, the docked ship doesn't count, we can now count up our influence on that island. In order to do this, we can once again look at our player board, and as you can see, each settler is going to provide one influence on that island, and each docked ship is going to provide two influence, whereas an undocked ship that's in a fjord provides zero influence to any islands. Lastly, we can see a temple on an island provides four influence, which is quite a lot. 
So let's come back over here. And as you can see, we have two, three, four influence. Now, if we have at least one boot on the ground and we have more influence here than any of our opponents, then that means we control this island and the player who controls an island gets to take the rune token that was placed there. Next up, we can place the blue rune in front of us and we will keep this for as long as we have control of that island. Now, we lose control of the island if an opponent has boots on the ground and more influence than us. If they tie, then we would still get to keep control of that island. If an opponent was able to do that, they would simply take this rune and put it in front of themselves. The other way we could lose control of this island is if we decide to leave the island with these settlers. There's ways to do that, and I'll explain that later. Or if these settlers are killed off the islands, and I'll explain how that could potentially work later on as well. As soon as we don't have boots on the ground at the island, we don't control it, even if nobody else controls it. And in that case, the rune token would be placed back onto the island. Now, having these island rune tokens is important for two main reasons. The first is these can unlock as well as power up various actions from the Viking cards that we have in our hand, and these are worth points at the end of the game. Speaking of that, I'd now like to draw your attention up here where we have three god cards. During setup, we randomly pulled three of these out, and we randomly assigned the blue, pink, and orange colors to be associated with those gods. Now, every time control of an island changes, the fury of the god matched up with the rune color for that island is going to increase by one. This means if the control goes from no one to somebody, that's going to increase the fury. And if somebody takes control from somebody else, we pass the island rune token to the new player, and that will also increase that god's fury. During setup, it looks like Odin, the Allfather, became the blue god for this game. And because we just took control of the island with the blue rune token, that means Odin's fury will increase by one. So we can focus over here and simply increase this token from zero up to one. Now, I'm sure you're wondering why the Fury of the Gods matters, and that has to do with endgame scoring for runes. Now, there are two different types of runes in the game, these island runes as well as the card runes that we can get through battle, and I'll explain how battle works later on. Now, once the game is over, the god who has the most fury is going to have runes associated with their color worth the most points. The god with the second most fury is going to be worth the second most points, and the god with the third most fury will have their runes be worth the least. If there happens to be a fury tie, then each of those gods will score for the lower of those tied positions. So if there's a tie for first, then both will score second place points, and then the third place god will still score the third place points. Speaking of those points, let's now focus at the bottom of the Raven board. As you can see, each one of the island runes is going to be worth 6, 5, or 4 points, depending on if the god associated with that rune is the most furious or least furious. Over here, the runes on these cards are going to be worth 4, 3, or 2 points, again, depending on how furious that god is at the end of the game. That means the runes on these cards are worth less than the island cards, but these cards cannot be taken away from you once you have them, whereas these island runes can. Now again, I'll talk more about these rune cards later on when we discuss how battle works in the game. Well, we're now done with Randy's leader action, and now if we want, we can potentially perform this rune action. We only have the option to perform this after we've potentially done the leader action, and if we have the prerequisite runes to make that happen. As you can see, this shows one blue rune, and that means we must either have a blue rune showing up on cards that have been played in the round already, for example, if we grab this from the deck and say that we had played this first and then that second, then this rune would activate that rune ability. And of course, the other option is these island runes can also activate. This is one of the main reasons we went to get this blue rune so that we could activate this action on our turn. Now, this is the resource exchange action, and it lets us spend any number of one type of resource to gain an equal amount of one other type of resource. Currently, we have no food, we have one iron, and we have two wood, and I think let's activate this and exchange both of our wood for two iron. That brings our iron up to three, and the reason why I think we want to do that is because in this round, I'm pretty sure we are going to want to battle with Grow. I haven't talked about battling just yet, but when you do battle, you use this top area and these values, but if there is a cost listed there, you have to pay that cost in order to participate, and Grow needs three iron. Of course, Asta only needs two iron, and they have a battle strength of 12 instead of 13, which is pretty close, but I would rather play Asta for some of these abilities, and I'll talk through that later, I think. Either way, this leaves us flexible so that we could potentially play Grow for a battle, and if ultimately that doesn't happen, we can always spend the iron to raid more villages later on. 
Well, speaking of villages, we do have one of these over here in front of us that we raided off the board earlier on in this turn. Now, after we perform all of the card actions we want to, we can then spend one of these village tokens to do a village dedication action. When you do this, you place the village either on the raven board or onto one of the god cards, and I don't think we want to do that right now. These can be very potent actions, and I think we should keep this so that we can stay flexible to potentially use it at some point later on when we have a better idea of what we need in that moment. Since we're not using this and we've done everything we can from this card, that means our turn has come to a close. We can now move clockwise to the green player. So green has to play one of their cards, and they've decided to go with this one, and they're going to put it face down. Face down cards participate in battle, and if there is no battle started, then the player who puts the first one of these face down will start a battle. If there's already a battle ongoing, you can put face down cards to join into it. At this moment, there is no battle, so green can now start one. And in order to do that, the green player has to select a rune card to battle over. There are a bunch of rune cards out here at the start of the game. The number that we have in these two rows will differ with the player count. And the only rune cards we have access to are the ones on the edges. So the green player has to select one of these four cards. And this is the one that they want the battle to be over. Now that card is going to be placed right over here next to the raven board. And it will stay there until this battle is resolved. Now, battles are resolved at the beginning of the player's turn who started the battle. That means after green, red will go, then we will go, and then before the green player takes a regular turn on their next turn, this battle will be resolved. The winner of the battle will gain that rune card, and any losers in the battle will have their forces sent to Valhalla, and I'll explain how all of this works when we actually resolve this battle. Well, that's all the green player is going to do on their turn, which means play can now move clockwise over to the red player. So, Red has to play a card, and if they want to, they could put a card face down. If they did that, then this card would be joining in the battle that has already been started, but it looks like the Red player has decided they don't really feel like fighting right now, so instead they'll put this card face up. This is Kare, and they can now perform the leader effect of this card. That is a harvest action, and the value on that action is the amount of resources the Red player will gain, and they can take multiple different types of resources with this action. After considering their options, they are going to take one food, as well as three wood. Now, every time a player performs a harvest action, they can potentially gain extra resources based off of the boats and temples they've already constructed. As you can see, when these tokens are removed, it reveals these symbols, and we do see that harvest symbol right over there. That means for every boat that is constructed, the player will harvest an extra food every time they do a harvest action. And for every temple they've constructed, every time they do a harvest action, they can gain one extra resource. That means if they harvested once they had built all three boats and both temples, they would get three bonus food as well as two extra resources. So in this case, that would be six resources plus three food, which is a gigantic amount. But obviously, they haven't actually built any of these yet. Well, the harvest action is pretty simple, and they are now done with it, and their rune action will let them explore. As you can see, that shows one settler moving to another island, and when the settlers move, they follow these ferry routes. Now, it doesn't matter if there are settlers where they are leaving from or where they are going, and it also doesn't matter if there are boats on docks or anything like that. Settlers can always cross these paths. As soon as an explore action is done, if that player who moved in now has more settlers on that island than any opponents, then just like when we deploy the settlers, all of the opponents who have less settlers on that new island will lose one settler from that island. Now at this point, the red player does not actually have any settlers deployed, and that's a moot point considering they can't even perform this action. They have to have at least one of the pink runes, either on cards that they've played already, or with these island runes that they can pick up, and they don't have either of those, which means this rune action is not available to them. So that's finished a quick turn for red, and that means that now we can go. And I mentioned on our last turn that we got some iron so that we could prepare to fight. And I actually like the idea of fighting for the card that the green player picked. So I think let's just jump right into battle and join the one that the green player started. We have this three iron already, and that is what we need in order for Grow to participate in this battle. So let's go ahead and flip this card over and put it down there. Now again, the reason we want to go with Grow instead of Asta is because I would really like to play Asta for these leader effects. This would let us move a ship up to three times, and then we also could activate this rune effect to explore, which would let us uh, spread out even more, which does seem like a good thing, whereas Grow's leadership ability is an explorer, as I said, and then down below, it says if we have four of the orange runes, we could then remove up to two settlers of our choice from anywhere on the map, 
it would not matter if we have control or ships or settlers there already. Obviously, that could be very powerful, but I don't really see us getting up to four of these orange runes in this era. As you can see, we only have one orange card, so that would be one of the four, and we don't have any of these from the islands. So I would rather use this card for the battle effect, which means the bottom parts will be ignored, and then save this one so that we could do both of these effects later on in this era. Now, after we played this card, we could do a Dedicate Village action, which I haven't described just yet, and I think we're still going to hold off, so I will explain how that works later on. Well, we're now done with our turn, so it's now time for Green to go, and before they actually perform their main turn where they play a card, we now have to resolve a battle. Remember, this happens at the start of a player's turn if they began a battle on their previous turn. Now, the way we resolve battles is quite simple. The first thing that we do is check to see if multiple players are in the battle. If that's the case, then those players will simultaneously reveal their cards. But if there is just one player in the battle, then that player is going to fight against invaders by drawing the top card from this deck. Now, I'll explain how fighting against the invaders works later on, because as you can see, there are multiple people in this battle. That means both of these cards can be immediately flipped over. And then if there are any costs associated with one of these cards, that does have to be paid. And if it can't be paid, then that card effectively doesn't participate in battle. That doesn't mean they have a value of zero and they lose. They just don't even arrive at the battle. So that player isn't even regarded as a loser. Now, there are actually benefits for losing in battle, and I'll explain that very soon. So, as you can see, we have to spend our three iron for grow, and then down here, the green player's card does not have a cost. When we focus in, you can see it shows a five, and then it shows plus, and then the orange rune. What this means is Liv's battle strength is five plus the number of orange runes they have, including this one right here. So if they had any of these island runes, then each one of those would add to this battle strength. And then, of course, if they had played any other cards that had the orange rune on it earlier on in this round, those would also add to Liv's strength. In this case, though, they just have one orange rune, so Liv's strength value is 6, and of course, Grow's strength value is 13, and now we just check all of the battle values, and the player who has the highest value is going to win, and all of the other players are going to lose. Now, if in this moment there is a tie for having the most strength, then all of the players are considered to lose, with no players being the winner. So, it looks like we are winning this battle with 13 versus 6, and the winner of the battle gains the rune card that was placed over here when the battle started. Now, the rune card not only shows one or two runes at the top, but it also shows a bag, and these are resources that the winner of the battle gains immediately. So, that means we will gain one food as well as two wood, and that's certainly great considering we didn't have any resources at all before this. After that, we will take this card and place it face down into any one of these rune card spots at the top of our board. Now, we can take a peek at these at any point in time, but we are hiding these from our opponents. And when the game is over, all of these runes will be worth points. It's important to note that since these are face down, those runes do not help us for various things that require runes, like the rune actions, as well as amplifying the strength of cards that are in battle. Now, when we look back at the Raven board, we can see that when the game is over, we are going to gain points for these runes based off of this set. That's four, three, or two points, which is obviously less than the six, five, or four points over there for the island runes. But by having this card, we are guaranteed to have this card, so we know we have these points coming in, and this is obviously going to influence how we want to anger the gods as the game continues on. So, once again, we can put this face down over here, and I do want to point out that all players can only have three of these rune cards throughout the game. If you were to ever gain a fourth card, that's fine. You then just have to pick one of the four cards that you have, and you put it face up back into either one of these rows on either of the ends. So, it's possible that we won't end the game with this card, but if that's the case, it will be our decision to place the card back over there because we won more than three battles. All right, we've gained all of the benefits for being the winner in this battle, but I did mention that battles also have losers, and losing isn't necessarily a problem. Now, every one of the cards that was put into battle that lost is considered to be defeated and sent to Valhalla. Now, the way this works is we look at the rune type on the card that was defeated, and the associated god is going to gain one fury, and the player who had the card go to Valhalla can then activate the matching god's action. So, Liv lost, and they go to Valhalla, and the rune on this card is orange, so that means Sif, the goddess of the harvest, is going to increase their fury by one because they're associated with orange. Now, over here, we can see the action for that associated god, and the green player may now activate this action because they lost. When we focus in, that losing action says they can collect any four resources of their choice. 
After considering the options for these four resources, Green has decided to take a single food and then three wood. Oops, I just realized this rune should not be over there. I put it there by mistake earlier on. That should be over there on the map. Sorry about that. All right, it's now time for Green to take their normal turn. Remember, up to this point, they were just resolving the battle that they started on their previous turn of the game. This means they have to pick one of their cards to play, and they are going to go with Gudrun. Now, this has the pink rune in the top left, and since they're playing it face up, they're going to activate the leader ability, and that lets them pick one of their boats, and then they can move it up to three times. They currently only have one boat, so they of course select that one, and they're going to use one movement to go to that adjacent fjord, and then for the second movement, they're going to head over here and dock. Now, there is a village token there, and they've decided to raid it. Remember, it costs one iron to raid in the first era, two to raid in the second era, and three to raid in the third. This is the first era of the game, so they will spend one iron to raid that village, putting that token next to their board. After that, they could move one more time, but they've decided to stop here. Now, they did end at a dock, which means they can deploy settlers onto this island, and they can deploy a number up to the move value of this action, which is three. Each settler costs one food to deploy, and it looks like Green is going to spend all three of their food to deploy three settlers onto that island. After that, they obviously take control of the island because they have one, two, three, four, five influence there. That's more than anybody else. And they have at least one boot on the ground. So they will take this blue island rune and put it in front of them. They're now done with the leader action, and the rune action is active because, as you can see, they do indeed have at least one orange rune in the form of this card that they already played. Now, this is an explore action, which lets them move one settler across a single ferry route to another island. The green player has three settlers over here on this island, and they've decided they are going to explore with this one. That settler is going to follow this ferry route over to that island, and as soon as they arrive there, they take control of the island. That's because they have boots on the ground, and their influence is one, which is more than anybody else. So they will take this pink rune, and of course, every time someone takes control of an island, the associated God's Fury is going to go up once. So Thor goes up one, and I did forget to do it before when they took this one earlier on in this turn. That would also increase the Fury of Odin by one. Well, at this point, Green is done with the actions on this card, and they do have a village over here, and they've decided they're going to use it to do a dedicate village action. Now, this action dedicates that village to the gods, and you can either dedicate it to a specific god by placing this village onto that part of one of the god cards. And if you do that, the action on all of the god cards increases the fury of that specific god twice. Now remember, the fury dictates how many points the various island and card runes are going to be worth at the end of the game. So by going over here and increasing one twice, that could tip the scale and potentially give you a whole bunch of points, depending on the runes that you have. Now the green players decided they aren't currently interested in increasing the fury of any of the gods and instead they are going to dedicate it over here on the Raven board. As you can see, there are four different dedication spots, and each of them is associated with one of the basic actions in the game. This one would let you do a build action. This one lets you do a harvest action of value two. And remember, that will get you extra stuff if you've built boats or temples because you've removed them from your board. This one lets you choose one boat and sail it up to two times. And that one lets you do a single explore action. Now you may have noticed this icon right here, and that is a restriction, and it also shows up on the god cards. This means each one of these spots that can be dedicated can only have a maximum number of dedication tokens equal to the current player count. This is a three-player game, and that means each one of the four spots on the Raven board, as well as the three spots on those god cards, can never have more than three village tokens dedicated to it. And of course, if it was a four-player game, then you could do each one of these up to four times. Now, this is the first one of the game, so obviously it's under the threshold. And the green player has decided to go over here so that they can perform the first build action of the game right now. For each build action, the player can spend wood in order to construct a boat or a temple. The amount of wood you have to spend is listed directly underneath that token, and you don't have to build these in order. You can build a more expensive one if you want to early, and then do one of the other ones later on. That might make sense if you have a whole bunch of resources, and you're in a position to spend a bunch before you potentially get some more. Now, in this case, the green player has five wood, so that means they could afford to build any of these boats, and as you can see, the benefit for all of them is the same. And the five wood threshold does also mean they could build this specific temple. Out of all of these options, they've decided to go with the temple, which is going to spend all five of their wood. 
Each time a temple is constructed, it has to be placed onto an island where that player has at least one settler. That means the green player could go here or here, and they've decided they want to build the temple over here. Now, if you remember from before, temples count as having boots on the ground, so that means if they leave this island with that settler, they are still going to have the ability to control this, and each temple has four influence for the purpose of controlling islands. So the green player was able to sneak over here on this turn and get that temple built, which is definitely going to solidify their control of that area and of this pink island rune for at least the short term. Well, overall, this was a pretty great turn for the green player, even though they lost that battle. In fact, there's an argument to be made that maybe it was better that they lost that battle versus winning it, considering they got those four resources that let them construct that temple on this turn. And now for the rest of the game, whenever they perform a harvest action, they will gain an extra resource of their choice for that temple that they constructed. Now, I do want to point out that there is no way for temples to be removed from the board once they've been constructed, although technically they can be moved by the player who controls them. As you you can see this card that was played by the green player has a rune ability that requires four of the blue runes and the effect says you can move a temple across one of those fairy lines. Now again, this is the only way to move temples, and players can only move their own temples, so they have very good control about where those temples will be out there on the map. Now, before we move on, I want to briefly talk about building boats. Obviously, the green player isn't doing this, but the way this happens is you spend the wood associated with that boat, and you then place it into a fjord that is adjacent to a unit that you already have out there on the board. At this point, green is done with a very effective turn, and now play will move clockwise over to the red player. Although before we see their turn, I'd like to once again come back over here and take a look at the losing effects for Thor and Odin. Again, these are only activated when you lose a battle, and the Viking that you put into that battle is associated with that god. For Thor, god of thunder, their associated action says that each other player must remove one of their settlers from an island of their choice. Now, obviously, that effect is better once everyone has deployed at least one settler out onto islands, and it's a great way to lower the influence that players have on islands so that you could potentially swing in and take control away from them. Over here for Odin the Allfather, this effect says you can collect one village that has already been dedicated from the Aramat or from a god mat. That means you can just take the village token and put it in front of yourself, which not only frees up a spot to activate that spot if it was already at the player count max, you remove that and now it could go there again. And of course you also gain access to this village token so that you can dedicate it onto any of these actions as long as they are not at their maximum. So, as you can see, the losing effect for all of these gods can be quite impactful, and the game comes with more than these three gods here. These are just the random ones that were chosen for this play. Alright, let's focus over here, and the red player can now choose one card to play for their turn. In this case, they've decided to go with Sigrid. They played the card face up, which means they are not putting it into battle, and the leader effect here says they can move one of their boats up to two times. Now, the card they just played also has a rune effect that requires them to have two of the orange runes, and currently they have one from Kare that they played on their previous turn. That means they are pretty motivated to get another one of those orange runes, specifically from taking control of an island that has an orange rune on it, so that they have the option of activating that rune action on this turn. With that in mind, they've decided to simply move one out of the two that they can do, and they'll dock right over here. Now they are going to raid this village, which will cost them one iron. So they go down to one, and now they can settle, putting up to two of their settlers over here, because again, the maximum you can play is equal to the overall sailing value that you had with this action. They are going to spend two of their food to place two down onto that island, and as soon as they do that, they take control of it. So they will take this orange island rune, and when they do that, the fury of Sif is going to go up by one. Well, they finished their leader ability, and now this rune ability is active, because again, they have at least two of the orange runes, and that is what this one needs. Now, this action is quite interesting. It says that you can flip this card over and start a battle or join a battle that's already ongoing. Now, they play this card face up to do this action, but because they can activate this effect, it now flips over and they can start a battle. Obviously, all of us know what this card is. Normally, when you start your turn putting a card face down, that is a mystery. So we can see that Sigrid has a base strength of 5 plus 1 for every one of the pink runes they have, and they currently have 1. So this is a strength of 6, and we can all keep that in mind as we decide whether or not we actually want to fight the red player in this battle. 
Now, they did start a battle with this effect, so that means they have to select one of the rune cards that they'll be fighting for with this battle. Once again, they can pick a card that's at the end of either of these lines, so those are the four options they have, and they decided to go with this one. It only has one rune showing on it, so that means it's going to be worth less points once the game is over, but as you can see, it is worth four resources immediately to the player who wins it, compared to the two over here of the double up runes, and the three of the cards that have two different runes on them. So it appears Red is looking to get a bunch of resources while also trying to get some points with these runes. So that's going to be placed over here next to the Raven board. All right, red is done with their turn, which means we can go, and we have these two cards in our hand. Now again, we know the value of this card that's in the battle. It's currently six, so if we wanted to, we could put one of these into battle in order to try and vie and take this card away from the red player. If the red player lost, of course, they do one of those Valhalla effects, and we have to keep that in mind. We, of course, know that this card had the pink rune on it, so the Valhalla effect of that is Thor, which would actually remove one of our settlers from the board as well as green, which isn't great. Now, looking at our cards, we have Ravina, and they have a strength value of 6, and that is not modified by anything. But unfortunately, 6 would tie with the 6 that we know this is, and if there's a tie for the most strength, then everybody loses. <laughs> so that um, isn't a hugely interesting option. I guess we would, again, get to activate something, and if we lost, that would get us 4 resources. But just playing this card would get us 4 resources, and we would also be able to get the benefit down here, which is a rune action that lets us draw 1 card from the top of the deck, and then we discard one card from our hand so it could be that card or it could be another card now obviously astra would win this battle but we would need to spend two iron in order to have astra compete in the battle and we currently have no iron we could spend this doing a village dedication to harvest to get that iron or we could just let the red player fight this out and not join in the battle i think that's going to be a better option for us right now so instead, I think let's just play Ravina and then activate this effect, which lets us do a harvest value of four. Now, it's very likely that on our next turn, we are going to play Asta, and they have the ability to move one of our boats up to three times, and then we could deploy up to three settlers. Every deployed settler costs one food, and we currently have one food. So I think let's gain two food with this four harvest, so that we could hypothetically deploy all three of those, and then we can gain two more resources, and it's somewhat likely with this move that we will land on a spot with a village that we could raid. So I think let's certainly gain one iron, so that we have one to spend in order to successfully raid and then for the last resource we could take a wood but we already have two and that would be enough for us to construct a boat which is likely all we're going to be doing in this first era of the game so i figure we should probably gain another iron or another food and you know what let's go with the iron so that's finished up our leader action, and then as I said, this rune action is activated because we do have at least one blue rune either with the island token or previously played cards. So we can draw the top card from the deck, and that one is bow, and we add them into our hand, and then we have to discard one card. So we have a good plan for Asta already, but it's possible the card that we drew is going to give us a better plan. We can see that bow has a leader ability that lets us build, and they have a rune ability that would let us move one of our boats up to two times. Now that requires us to have at least one orange rune, and we do have one because of Ravina that we just played. Now that's interesting, because being able to build would let us spend this wood to get another boat. And obviously Asta does not have a build option. Now, I was figuring we would probably build a boat using one of these dedicate a village actions. Uh, and down here, Asta would let us move one of our settlers once, which could let us bolster our position or potentially let us take over another island with just one settler in order to gain another one of those rune tokens. Of course, having just one settler on the island is pretty risky. If an opponent was to go over to that island and deploy two or more, it would wipe that settler out. So perhaps Bow is actually a better plan for us. On our next turn, we could construct and then sail up to two times. Obviously, we would not be using all three of our food to deploy, but that might be a better use of our actions. We wouldn't worry about exploring as much, and that would free up our dedications to do other actions like gaining more resources. Yeah, I think we're going to stick with Bow, and that means Asta is going to be discarded. The discard pile is right over here, and at this point, we've done all of our actions from the played card that we have, and we do still have this village that we got on our first turn of the game, and we could use it to dedicate right now if we wanted. 
But honestly, again, I think we should just wait for the moment. Um, the action options are nice and flexible, and if we were to do something like harvest, I think I would rather build first to then gain the harvest benefit of the icon that's revealed when we construct a boat. So let's just keep on holding this, and it's possible we'll not even use this in the first era. We'll just have to see what our options are as we continue through the game. Well, with our turn done, the green player can now go. They have to play a card from their hand, and they've decided they aren't going to be joining in the battle that Red started. Instead, they'll play Najal face up. The leader action lets them do a harvest of four resources, and then they gain a fifth resource because they've constructed this temple. In this case, they've decided to take one food, then they're going to take one iron and three wood. After that, the optional rune ability on Najal says if they have at least one blue rune, they can gain two food. It's worth noting this is not a harvest action, it's just a gain specific resources action, so you do not get any benefits from the things that you've built off your player board. At the moment, green does indeed have at least one blue rune, so they can activate this optional effect, which will give them two more food, bringing them up to three. Well, green is done with a quick turn, so now it's time for red to go, and they started a battle on their previous turn. They have this face-down card right over here, so before they actually perform their turn, they have to evaluate this battle. Now, as I mentioned before, you could either fight against other players or against neutral invaders, and you only fight against neutral invaders if no one else joins into the battle that you started. As you can see, only one player is currently in the battle, so that means red is going to fight against the neutral invaders, and the first thing that we do is flip over this card, and we can once again see that Sigrid is fighting, and they have a strength of 5 plus 1, because the red player only has one pink rune. So red has a strength of six. The way this works is red simply draws the top card from the deck and this is the invader they are going to fight against. They put that right here and they just have to defeat this invader and then that card will actually stay there for the rest of the game. The next time anybody fights against the invaders we will draw another card from the top of the deck and put it like that and every rune showing including from the previous invaders will apply for the new one. In fact, the runes on invaders count as wild, so as we can see, there is Ulf right here that red is fighting, and they have a strength of three times the number of blue runes the invaders currently have. Now again, every rune is functionally wild, so this counts as both blue, pink, or orange, so the invaders currently effectively have one blue rune, so they have a strength of three. Now this does show a cost of one iron, but when the invaders need to spend something, they just have it satisfied. They don't actually have to pay anything. So in this case, if it was like that, and then this invader was coming out, then this rune would count as orange or pink or blue. So in this case, Ulf would actually have three times two or six strength. Obviously, that's not the case. This is the first invader, but as you can see, as we continue to fight invaders, more and more will come out from the top of the deck, and the invaders will get a lot more difficult to defeat as the game goes on, especially if you bump into the ones that have scaling increases in strength based off of the runes that have already been played. Well, in this given circumstance, Ulf is surprisingly weak. Obviously, late in the game, three times those runes could be devastating, but right now it's three times one. So that has a total strength of three, which is obviously lower than the total strength of five that the red player has. Now, in this case, the red player is going to win, and the invaders will lose. When invaders lose, the fury of the matching god for this rune is going to go up by one. That's blue, so that means Odin's fury will go up once, but the invaders never activate the actions on these gods. Now, if the red player had a strength value less than the invaders, then of course the red player would increase the fury of the matching god, and then they could activate the losing action. The last possibility is of course a tie. If that happened, then both the invader and the player are considered to lose. That means the fury is going to go up for each of those applicable runes, and then of course the player can activate the losing benefit of the matching god. Whenever there's a tie for the most strength in battle, whether it's against the invaders or against an opponent, the specific rune card will go back out onto the board where it was originally removed from. Well, in this circumstance, Red was able to defeat the invader, so they are going to gain this card. That is worth one pink card rune at the end of the game, and it immediately gets them two wood as well as two food. So they have their maximum of seven wood, and they also have three food, and now it's time for them to play a card from their hand. After thinking through their options, they are going to play Frody. That card is face up, and it lets them move one of their ships up to three times. In this case, they're just going to move twice. They'll head out here, and then they'll dock into this spot, and they are going to spend one iron, which will let them raid this village. 
After that, they can deploy up to three times, and they do have three food. They've decided to go for it. They're going to spend all three of their food to put these three settlers down onto that island. And when they do that, they are going to gain control, which will get them this pink island rune. When that happens, Thor's Fury is going to go up once, and then they can activate this optional effect because they do have at least one of the pink rune. In fact, they have two because they just picked up this island token. That effect is going to gain them iron equal to the number of the orange runes they currently have. And they actually have three of those, so that's going to get them three iron, bringing them up to three. After that, they've decided to dedicate a village. In fact, they have a couple of these tokens they could use. They're going to use this one to do a build action, so they can stack that right over here. Uh, once again, this is a prototype version, so the village tokens won't look exactly like this in the final version. Now, this will let them do a build action. And they've decided to spend five of their seven wood in order to construct a temple right over here. Again, temples must go onto an island where the player has at least one settler. So they went from having just two influence on that island to six, and that definitely makes it more likely that they keep control of this island for at least the short run. Now, they do have another village token over here, and they've decided they are going to dedicate it as well. And this time, they are going to harvest resources. In particular, that will get them two resources, but then, of course, they gain a third one because they built this temple. So that is three resources total, and they are going to get three wood with it, which brings them up to five. Well, red is done with a pretty good turn, and now we get to go. Now, this is going to be our last action of the era. We just have one card left in our hand. And I do want to point out that if we wanted to start a battle right now, we would just put this face down in front of us, and then we would actually immediately fight the invaders. The reason for that is because normally battles are performed at the start of our next turn, but we won't have another turn. So again, starting battles with your final card just instigates a battle against invaders. And considering there's already one invader out here, we are less likely to be able to defeat them. And we can see that Bo has a battle strength of two plus our blue runes, and we only have one of those. So that's a battle strength of three. Now, technically, we could start a battle with the intention of losing. Uh, we know that Bo is blue, and that's associated with Odin, and that effect would let us take one of these village tokens back, and then we could replay them. But I think right now it's probably going to be better just to use the actual abilities on Bo. So let's play them to the right of our previous cards. Bo will go right here, and now we can do a build action. And the only thing we can afford is this boat, because we have two wood. That's fine. Getting boats out is going to get us more food that we can obviously spend to continue to deploy our settlers out on the map as we vie for control of the islands. Now we have to actually build this boat, and it goes into a fjord that's adjacent to our units. And I think let's build this boat right over there. That was a quick build action, and now we can do this optional rune action because we have at least one of the orange runes, and that is going to let us move one of our ships up to two times. So we can choose either one of these ships, and remember a ship at a dock is going to add two influence to an island for keeping control. So I figure we may as well move this boat right over here and leave that one for the time being. Now we can move up to two times, and that also means we can deploy up to two times if we dock at an island. Remember, if after we add settlers to an island we have more than other players, then each of those players is going to remove one of their settlers. That means we could head over here and then deploy two of our settlers to this island. We would then have more settlers than our opponent. We don't look at influence at all, and Green would lose this. Although, in that case, there would actually then be a tie for control. We would have boots on the ground, and so would the Green player with this temple. The temples provide four influence, and each one of the settlers provides one, and a docked ship provides two. So, that would be four against one plus one plus two, which is also four. Remember, if there is a tie for island control, then the the rune will stay in the control of the player who previously had it because you have to have more influence than them to take it. So I'm not sure if this is actually the plan that we want to go with for this turn. Of course, if we had not discarded Asta, we could have played them on this turn and then deployed up to three times, which would have let us move over to, well, I guess this island over here potentially, and then we could have knocked out one of these, and then that would have given us control of this island, and we'd take that blue rune away from the green player. But, you know, we decided not to play Asta. We wanted to be efficient with our actions and get this build done, and because of that, we are only deploying up to two, so we have to deal with the consequences of the decisions that we've already made. Now, one thing I would like to do is raid another village while it's cheap. We can do that, so let's go for it. We have two movement, and we can use this boat and move one, two, and then dock on the spot, and then we can raid this village by spending one iron. 
we had two iron, so we can afford that. And then we can deploy up to two settlers over there. And I figure let's put both of them down. Each settler will cost us one food, so we spend two. And then we can place those over there. And now we control this island, so we can take this orange island rune token and put it in front of us. And then, of course, Sif's Fury is going to increase once. Well, we're done with our actions, and at this point, we could dedicate one or two villages, but I think we're actually going to wait on both of these. I know I'm a bit of a broken record, I keep saying that throughout this entire era, that we should wait and keep these to be flexible, and I think that's still the case. The reason for that is because while we could do some things that would be reasonably effective, like gather a bunch of resources, I feel like it probably makes sense to wait a little bit longer. If we are able to build some more things before we do those gather actions, then we could gain extra stuff, and gathering right now gets us resources that we don't even have a plan for. We don't have any cards in our hand, and in the next era, we were going to have five cards in our hand, and I think it'd be better to hold onto both of these to maybe use one or both of them to increase the options that we have for good actions with those cards. And of course, we can just hold onto these until essentially the end of the game, and then drop them down onto these god mats to increase fury in the specific gods that we feel we have an advantage of with the various island and card runes that we've picked up throughout the game. There's definitely a strong temptation to spend these immediately after getting them, but I think holding on to them until the right moment is also a smart idea. So that's going to finish our last action of the era, and now the green player can go. They of course have to play their final card, and they are not going to fight invaders, they are going to play Gorm. This says they can choose one of their boats and move up to three times, and it looks like this is going to be bad news for us. The reason for that is because they're going to move their only boat here one two, three times, and as soon as they enter this port, they are actually going to kick us out of the port, and then we get to decide which one of these two fjords we want to put our boat into. We already have a boat over here, so I figure we will have our boat be kicked out into that fjord, and now Green can deploy up to three settlers onto that island. They do indeed have three food, and they've decided to spend all three of it, and this is going to deploy all of the settlers they have left on their mat. Remember, if you want to deploy while you have no settlers over here, then as a free action, you can take any settler back from the board that you want and put it over here, and then immediately deploy that to where you want to go. So, Green is going to deploy all three of these to the island. And as that happens, we can see that Green now has more settlers than we do, so unfortunately, one of our settlers is going to be removed. They will go right back to our mat, and that is definitely unfortunate, especially considering we just lost control. When the green player kicked our boat out, we effectively lost two influence from there, and then when we had a settler removed, that also removed an influence. In fact, when we focus in over here, we can see that green has one, two, three, four, five influence, and we just have one. So that means green is going to take control of the island away from us. And that is the blue island, so they will take this blue island rune from us. And of course, whenever control changes on an island, the associated god is going to gain one fury. So that is going to be Odin going up to the four fury spot. Well, let's finish the green player's turn, and we are certainly not happy about that happening. But either way, it's now time for the red player to go, and this will be the final action of the first era. Now, once again, they could play this face down and then fight against an invader, but they've decided they're going to put it face up, and this is Knud. Now, the action over here is they can build, and then the rune action also lets them build. They do, of course, need to have two pink runes in order to do that rune action. They have one from here, and they have one from the islands, so that means they can do two build actions in a row on this turn. They currently have five wood, so they are going to start by spending two of it with their first build action to construct this boat, and it can go down into any fjord adjacent to one of their units. And they've decided to build it right over there into the same fjord with our boat. After that, they of course get another build action from this rune action down there, and they have three wood, and this boat costs three wood. So that means they can spend the three and then build this boat out, and they've decided to put it into that fjord. After that, Red's done with their turn, and they're feeling pretty good about this first era. You can only build five things throughout the entire game, and they got three of those five things built. Of course, the two remaining things are the most expensive. That being said, when they do harvest actions for the rest of the game, they will be even stronger. They are going to gain two extra food and one extra resource of their choice with each of those harvest actions, so they're feeling very happy with their current position. Well, at this point, we are now done with the action phase of the era, because no one has any cards left in their hand. This means we can move into the cleanup phase for the era, and this is quite simple. We just take all of the Vikings that were played throughout this era, and we put them into the discard pile. 
The next thing that we do is move the Raven token down once, and that means we are then entering the next era of the game. Now, at the start of each era, we have to check to see if the horn will move. And remember, the player with the horn will be the first one to play actions during the action phase of that era. Now, the way we move this horn is we count the number of island runes each player has, and then the player with the least island runes will have the horn go to the player immediately to the left of them. Effectively, what that means is the player with the least number of island runes is going to be the last player in that round, and the reason for that is because generally it's better to be later in turn order than early in turn order for area control type games like this. After we've made sure the horn is in front of the correct person, the next thing that we do is shift into the next drafting phase. Now, in the second era, we are going to draw five cards each, and then we are going to pass those counterclockwise, and then in the action phase for that round, we are going to play five Vikings instead of the four we saw in the first era. And remember, every time you raid a village in the second era, it's going to cost two iron. Once the second era is done, we will move into the third, where we are going to deal out and draft six cards, and then play those six cards during the action phase. And in that third era, it costs three iron to raid any of these villages, if there happen to be any of them left. Now what that means is over the course of the game, we are going to play six plus five plus four, or 15 Vikings, before the game ends. Now on that note, let's talk about how the game ends and how we get our points. And again, the game will be over once we have fully completed these three eras. At that point, we can shift into final scoring, and for that, we can actually clear everything off of this raven mat and flip it over, because as you can see, this has a scoreboard on it, and it also shows the points that we get for the island and card runes that we've picked up. Again, that is listed down here as well for reference. Each player has a victory point scoring marker, and at this point, everyone will reveal all of their card runes. And then we have to look up here to the gods to figure out which one of them is the most furious because runes of that color will be worth the most points. If the game was to end right now, we could see that Odin is at 4 fury, Sif is at 3, and Thor is at 2. So that means every one of the blue island runes would be worth 6 points, and every blue card rune is worth 4. The Sif island and card runes will be worth 5 and 3 points respectively, and the Thor island and card runes are worth 4 and 2. If there's a tie with gods, for example, if Sif was at two, then in this case, those two gods score points for the lower of that tie. Both of these gods are effectively in second and third place, so that means both of them will score for the third place option. Once again, we can track our points with this mat, and once we have finished getting all of the points from these island and card runes, the player with the most points will be the winner. As you can see, all of the points in this game come from these runes that we are vying for on the islands and that we are battling for with these cards. Well, at this point, I've taught just about all of the rules to the game, so that's going to bring this tutorial to a close. I hope that you enjoyed learning how to play Tiny Epic Vikings, and I do want to ask that if any part of this game really jumps out to you, or you have some comments about how these different turns went, then please comment about that down below, because I love to see that kind of feedback. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.